I mean, you can take a robot and put a million dollars into it, then another million dollars in ads, and then you want to put this robot to re return on investment and find something to it, then you find out the client will pay you, oh, I'll give you $10,000 for what this robot's designed to do. Well, it's basically designed to replace a man. So in the robots I'm doing, I'm looking at trying to find a way in simplifying them, cut okay. those costs down on the robots, give them their missions and make their missions more flexible. That's awesome. That way, if we spend a million dollars on a robot, you can go ahead and task the robots with multiple missions instead of just one mission. Welcome to Collaborative with Spencer Krauss. This is a place for accomplished professionals to talk about their life and their work in an informal and hopefully an insightful way. If you like what you see, hit subscribe below. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Cloud Road Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Stephen Antelich of Paragonics Tech LLC. Uh, he was a Marine for 13 years and also specializes in designing explosion-proof robots. Some really cool stuff. This guy's a brilliant engineer, and I have a ton of respect for what he's done. Uh, Steve, welcome to the pod. Well, thank you, Spencer. Um, interesting to be back in Pittsburgh and everything after all the years I've spent everywhere else. Um, I've been doing... Uh, casts like this and podcasts and interviews like this and anywhere from the Netherlands, everywhere else where I was working for four years. And now I find myself back in Pittsburgh um, trying to move this, regenerate everything that I'm doing now in a robotics world, trying to resurface everything, taking everything I've done, spent the time through COVID, uh, redesigning everything, trying to... Nice tweak out the tweaks that we've done, put the best of the best. Can you say some of the refinements you've made or is that? No, awesome? no, the refinements I've made in, in the robotics are, are really simple and it's something that a lot of the robotics should do. Um, for example, there, I see a lot of robots in the world today, as you've seen, and the investment and the money and the capital that's invested in robots is enormous. Correct. I mean, you can take a robot and put a million dollars into it, then another million dollars in ads, and then you want to put this robot to re return on investment and find something to it, then you find out the client will pay you, oh, I'll give you $10,000 for what this robot's designed to do. Well, it's basically designed to replace a man. So in the robots I'm doing, I'm looking at trying to find a way in simplifying them, cut okay. those costs down on the robots, give them their missions and make their missions more flexible. That's awesome. That way, if we spend a million dollars on a robot, you can go ahead and task the robots with multiple missions instead of just one mission. That's cool. So that, that's where I'm going with everything. That, this is what I've learned in this COVID break, let's say, and which, you know. I feel like we all learned something. I mean, because what else are you going to do but make yourself better? You have to. That, that, eating ice cream, you know? I've ate too much ice cream. I've sat around <laughs> with the kids and uh, generally just got fat with everybody watching everything on the side. But... I have I focused. did that, and then I, I kind of rebounded. That's started exactly. doing push-ups and this is correct. Aesthetics, yeah. This is correct. Now I'm back into it, getting back into shape physically. Nice. You know, kind of had a few eureka moments that I'm trying to pursue at the moment with uh, where we are. Uh, finally, had a great success six weeks ago in uh, in Brazil. We nice. spent a lot of time in Brazil getting the robot down there. Again, focusing on taking a uh, simplifying the robot, simplifying its mission. However, making it robust enough to be able to be used around the world. Yeah. And, and, and in my world, you know, we had started off. I in mean, there's the, a lot of robustness and simplicity, I feel like, but that is more difficult to achieve than complexity. Sometimes. It's a balance. You have to balance how tough you make the robot and how simple you make it and then how user friendly you make it. And then the UX for sure combats that, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then, you know, we take these robots and now now I want to take them. And one of the one of the great things in 2018, we had a great success in developing a robot for hazardous environments. What kind of hazardous environments? Well, by hazardous environments, a lot of people confuse that with uh, okay, we're going into a minefield or a radiation area. So the robot has to be... Those are hazardous environments. For sure. So the robot has to be strong. Yeah. And the robot has to be able to withstand all kinds of uh, uh, input onto it that, that it needs to repel these uh, energies that to make it work. 
So what we've done is the, the hazardous environment I'm looking at are hazardous environments that are flammable, uh, what's known as explosive environments. Yeah. Uh, so, so like being inside an explosive gas tank, so, so like butane, naphtha. Correct. Okay, wow. So imagine this, opening a, uh, opening a gasoline storage tank <clears throat> and then dropping a robot into the gasoline storage tank. So now- Most robots would explode. Most robots- Along with the tank. The robot wouldn't explode, but the robot would cause an incident that could create what we call in our field, the mushroom cloud. And, and uh, being where I've been, as you've seen in the video from Singapore, I was the one that was on top of the tank next to the valve when they opened it. Holy crap. And By the, the way, uh, this video was of a tank full of naphtha. I don't know how many gallons or liters that was. It was huge. Uh, it, I believe it was contained, I think it was at a 50,000 gallons. Wow. Plus it had a vapor space. Now, what Which people don't understand, more terrifying. what you don't understand is the area of the fluid itself, the naphtha itself. As long as you remove on the triangle, there's a triangle, which is uh, oxidizer, oxidizer fuel and ignition, and ignition points. Oh. So if you eliminate any one of those on the triangle, nothing will happen. So basically the naphtha doesn't explode. It's the vapor area that's above it. Well, I mean, that's why I said that's way more terrifying. Oh yeah. It, 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 it tends to, you make sure that your checklists are done for How years. Big is the vapor area. The vapor area can extend depending depending on 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 the uh, conditions, atmospheric conditions. Uh, you have uh, uh, levels of heat. For example, the atmosphere heat will induce a higher level of LEL or a lower level depending. So if you're in Siberia or Alaska, these levels wouldn't be encountered because the material would not off gas. It would okay. contain its uh, explosive level very low. That or if you're in Saudi Arabia or where we were in Singapore where the temperature was you know, 40 degrees C. So the everything everything is right on the edge of its point. And then some of these materials were in have what's known as an auto auto ignition point. Yeah. You know, some auto ignition points are actually at room temperature. So basically the, the contact of oxygen, the material, and then the temperature of the room auto ignites the material. And uh, these are areas that of course, now you imagine now you want to design a robot because you want to keep when you human. auto ignites, you mean? Auto ignition, which is where, <sighs> poof. Can you, can you elaborate on that? Okay, you, you've got your temperature, the air, the air temperature that the source is. Then you have the material. Uh, the the product the product will start to vaporize at a certain temperature depending yeah. on the product and that makes sense to me so okay far. but the product as it becomes a vapor mixes with the oxygen in the atmosphere which is now an explosive mix. which is now an explosive mix but it has an auto ignition point let's say 72 degrees c or oh 70, okay so that's 72 degrees F. temperature of okay poof it will ignite just the fact that it mixes at that temperature Jeez. Some of these materials need to be stored at. So below. if you get it to seventy-two, that's your ignition. And you could. And, there and are materials. There are materials that will do that, and wow. uh, these materials, of course, are extremely volatile and, and, and can end in all kinds of, as we said, the mushroom cloud. Yeah. So now somebody comes up from Exxon Mobil, Chevron, Phillips sixty-six, or all these other places. Hey, innovation people, please. We will throw money at anybody that can go in this tank, go inside, clean it without us taking the material out. Okay, we've done that. I've been cleaning tanks for since 1999. Nice. Cleaning them while they're in service, no problem. But now you want me to develop you a robot that will go in and do the same thing, except it has to pass through each of the zones or what's known as divisions. In the US, North America, class one, div one, Class one, division two, these are areas of glass. It's a gaseous area, so class one. Division one means the propagation of an explosive atmosphere is very high. Okay. And then in, the, in Europe, they use- What is they div use, two? I just div said. two would be, is a possible propagation of a okay. air mix, of a explosive mix. Neither of those refer to just straight up gas. It's, it's the fuel air mix. Correct. Okay. It's if that is going to be present when you or the robot is in that area. Got it. Or in the ATEX. I'm used to the ATEX European zone, which would be zone zero, one, two. 
So zero being, if you open that hatch, it's guaranteed there will be an explosive gas mix. Zone one, it's possible there will be an explosive gas mix. Zone two, it's not very prevalent, but it could, or a non-classified zone, which means that at no point will there be an a explosive mixture in the area that you're in. These are all based in areas of the tank, whether it's outside the tank, at the hatchway, inside the tank, in the vapor space, or some tanks don't have a vapor space and the fluid is all the way to the roof and you open the lid and there's the liquid right in front Probably of Probably a good thing. Probably a better thing when it's there that you can see it because the ability to extinguish is much better than having you know, the worst tanks you can think of are the tanks that are empty. Oh, Jesus Christ. I don't, know if you've, I don't know if you've ever heard this saying, well, you better have your fuel tank filled more than empty because the explosive mixture is, is higher on an empty tank. As a bit of an amateur pyromaniac, I believe you. Yes, that, that's exactly right. <laughs> so the idea then, you've got to build a robot to enter these spaces. And... Uh, and everybody wants this robot to be safe like this, and everybody wants this robot to enter these spaces. Oh, you can do it, no problem. And what you see is a lot of people will just simply go, well, if it worked in the ocean, and these ocean robots, we can take these ocean robots and put them inside the tank. It should be no problem. That seems really dumb. No, but there are actually people out there who have taken subsea or ocean robots and placed them in hydrocarbon successfully they have done it successfully and okay. and and well i mean I, I would think you're designing for different constraints and, and this is me coming from a lay person's perspective and not a lay i mean i'm a roboticist but mm -hmm. this is not my my specialty i mean i i do mostly biomed mm -hmm. so i um this is interesting um so I mean, I would think that there's certain things you would have to design for. But again, this is me just well guessing like an idiot. What people don't realize is in the early years, in the from 2000 to 2005, a lot of people were experimenting with it and, and putting these robots in. Uh, some successfully, some not so successfully, because it's a lot of because it's so sealed to the outside world that you can. Well, what what they've tried to do in it is they tried to take right off the shelf. What people don't realize, naphtha, naphtha is a penetrant. Water is completely different. It's completely the opposite of what they're going into. So a lot of people in the early years failed to understand that the media they're going in, as well uh, for, for ball uh, ballasting, when you ballast the, the robot to go in and go in is to counter the uh, effects of, uh, of density. Well, yeah. water based so to make on it one. Load or sink, depending Correct. Where you want to be in the tank. So water based on one. Well, naphtha is 0.6. Okay. Oh, okay, 0.6. So everything in the naphtha. Probably helps you from a weight perspective, I would think. No, you just drop. You sink like a, like a boom right okay. to the bottom. Well, I mean, if you're using a water vessel, but I would think you could reduce weight. But I don't know. Maybe I'm an idiot. Well, what it was, and on top of that, it's a penetrant. So people would take plastic things that were used with plastics, put them in the naphtha or put them in the diesel fuel or put them in the kerosene. And they would wonder why when they removed it, everything was fat, ugly, and twisted. <laughs> well, no. you have a chemical. You say, petro is that synonymous with solvent? Uh, petrochemicals or anything that's part of a uh, refined product. Okay. So, so in, 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 your, in your oil and gas industry, you have what's known as raw mother nature produced crude oil. Got it. Crude oil, in a demonstration that we were in with DECRA when we were doing a lot of the ATEX certifications for the robot, actually sat there one day and put two glasses on the table in a demonstration they showed on a video. They didn't do it in the, in the, in the engineering effect, but what they did is they took diesel fuel and took a cigarette and snuffed the cigarette out. Didn't do anything. Didn't do anything. Yeah. They took the one glass, a, a similar amount of crude oil. The cigarette got this close to it, you know, maybe two, three inches away, it auto-ignited the Interesting. crude oil. I've done that experiment with diesel, and I've seen that result, which is why I was able to just guess. I would not have expected that with crude. That's interesting. So you understand crude oil and gasoline and any other pr refined product comes with an SDS sheet. So you know what's in it. We know what we've done. They've done the test. They've done mass spectrometer. They know what's in the gasoline. 
Yeah. Nobody knows what's in crude oil. No, it comes from nature. Unrefined. It's, it's unrefined. It comes from nature. It, it can be mixed with multiple different crude oils from multiple different areas. And this is the goal that most of your Exxon Mobiles is they want to do this. And now their goal is, is noble. Is that screw with your ability to sense in terms of vision on the robot? Well, there is no vision. In most okay. materials that you're in, there is no vision. I mean, we have videotape from most of your refined product that you can see somewhat for vision-wise, but we use everything's used acoustics. So you have to use acoustics to see anything. Do you have to calibrate that differently than you would? You have to calibrate all of it because each of the materials has a different speed of sound. I believe that. So so like I described to you in the density of naphtha compared to water. So if you were to take a sonar that was used uh, anywhere off the shelf and say- Faster, okay, I would guess? Much faster. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. And then you would have to change it, adjust it for the speed of sound, for how fast it goes, feet per second, uh, meters per second, and then do the adjustments for working inside the material. But then you have this other part, which is, your ATEX constraints and your class one, dear one constraints. Okay. I need this ultrasonics to pulse and they, it sends an energy wave out. Well, if that pulse happens in the zone, that pulse could create an ignition source just from the UT. So you can imagine that that's why a lot of stuff is constrained in, in, uh, in this. And again, we go back to when I was describing that you have these $1 million robots, okay? And they're focused on one mission. Well, to get this certification, once you get this certification, you spend all this money. I'm sure that's where a lot of money goes. Once you get the cert majority of it goes to the certification. Once you get it, you cannot deviate that robot from anything that it's in, then its mission states. You cannot make mechanical modifications. You cannot make changes to anything in there. So it's just locked completely. It's locked Total completely, design locked. design locked. If you go ahead and want to say, okay, well, I need this robot to go ahead and I need to put a cleaning brush on to remove the debris because we built this robot. I took it to ExxonMobil and we put the robot in the tank. And you might say, we're not altering the robot, we're adding an accessory. You, but you, that's not allowed under the current regulations that are governing all of them. And that's, and that's in the US, that's the ATEX in the Metro, and all the other certifying bodies. And now that Britain has separated from Europe, now there's a, Britain has got their own <laughs> one. So that's a whole nother story. Are they pretty much the same thing, but just three Well, basically or? what I've seen, and I've been in many discussions with the uh, underwriters laboratories, UL, NEC. Very cool. In trying to help people migrate this minefield of certification. By the way, I love that you said underwriters laboratories. I was like, huh? and you were like, UL. I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. underwriters yeah. laboratories. So yeah. underwriters laboratories, which is it has done a lot of the work with the NEC, National Electric Code. Got it. And NEC stipulates the guidelines for class one, div one. Now Wait, in that's Europe, the NEC? That's the NEC. The hell do the National guys Electrical know about... Code. Uh, never mind. Okay. They, all it is is about electrical, electronics well, those are used. I mean, those are... No, a different NEC. Okay. Yeah. The National Electric Code is the code that is set up in the regulations are written guidelines for anything you would build to be going into a uh, hazardous location. Okay. And again, it hazardous is location, okay, got it. It, this is, this is not talking about minefields or radioactivity or, or radiation. This has to do with uh, when you enter the environment that the robot would detonate the environment. Yep. So, so the robot is the danger. The robot is the pinnacle of danger. And we have seen that these have issues in that area. And what we don't want to, what I, my, my goal in life is to make sure that no matter who fields a robot, you know, I support the robotics across the board, anybody that wants to build one. The thing that I have seen in the past is when one person were to detonate, let's say one robotic system who decided to take the shortcut and manipulate a certification or not do it fully Another type. or find a scrupulous type of notifying body that would just rubber stamp anything for a fee. Unscrupulous. Or, uh, unscrupulous. I'm terribly sorry. Yeah. No, no, it's all good. I, I'm not so, you. I just, I'm a dick. It's no, no. Good. I'm glad you said that because I, I, I tend to ramble. But 
is to find these unscrupulous people that would go ahead and, and, and rubber stamp these uh, certification methods. And then what you have is one detonation, okay? So you have a loss of uh, equipment, material, facilities, and God forbid the loss people. of humans. Yeah. If you had, a, and, and, and some of these things are so simple to detonate. If you've, you can go on YouTube at any time now and look on YouTube at tank farm fires, uh, detonations of tanks. They just had one recently in Iran where the, somebody was working on a valve. Jesus. Simply using the wrong tool and the wrong clothing created a static spark. Ah. And toof, the whole thing lit up. They've never found four of the people because they basically were vaporized. Then they had another one in Chevron, which was uh, Pembroke, England. Uh, currently now, I believe it's the Valero uh, facility in uh, Pembroke, England. Valero is doing some good stuff right now. I mean, they're... Yeah, Valero is doing much better. And they they've did, did a lot. I worked on the facility there. But we had to take a safety course, of course. Anytime you enter these sites, you take extreme amounts of safety yeah. uh, just to get on the site. But we went on and they were showing what had happened just because one person failed to connect a grounding wire to a vacuum truck. And a lot of the robots today use vacuum trucks as methods to remove the material. It's an easy mistake to make. It, it, well, that's why I like... Oh, the... The trolleys, I'm sorry. Hey, North Pittsburgh. Yeah, yeah I, f I forgot about where we are on Arlington. So we, uh, so ATEX compared to the other one, well, ATEX comes up with a version of the uh, uh, 113, then the 153. Well, one is worker safety and one is equipment safety. So the idea is to combine the two, worker safety and equipment safety. We're in the U.S., we don't have that. See, in the, in, in the ATEX version of it, to get a zone one, and the worker safety, it would maintain that you have to have a checklist provided that you would maintain that the worker makes sure he connects the ground. And then a supervisor would come in before energizing, would make sure the ground is connected. Nice. So like three levels of safety, almost like launching a space third, Because that sounds like two. That's the two. The third one is once you, before you get the final okay to check, all teams agree that everybody has completed the. So if you have multiple cool. members of the team no team can say no without the other team agreeing. No team can say yes without all the teams saying yes. So at any point in time, if one team member wants to recheck something, it's his obligation to do that. And all the other team members are trained to smile and walk along with him and do it. Because if you don't, then that's where the accidents happen. And everybody always says, oh, it'll never happen. Oh, it'll never happen. Oh, it'll never happen. It only happens once and you yeah. detonate this mushroom cloud, then the entire robotics field is thrown back 10 years. I believe it. This, this, this is, this is why I'm so passionate about this safety on robots. It, is I've seen things where they've gone because you know, we, we, I did my first robotic online tank cleaning and inspection in 1999, okay? In That's Cleveland, awesome. Ohio, we went there and did it. And we had another person go in and did it and completely flubbed it up and canceled all robotics use here. The state of Pennsylvania. Yeah, of course. The, the Department of, of Environmental Protection in, in the state of Pennsylvania doesn't allow for robotics inspections of uh, above ground storage tanks simply because, and I had interviewed the particular gentleman in, in charge of this and asked him why. He said, because we had a client come in with a robot and the robot is still in the tank today. And, and we see how we as a group of roboticists, and we want to enter this environment. Everybody's hard charging, flying into it. And I always, always said, like, you need to take a break. Take a break, sniff the ground in front of you, look and see, and make sure you're doing it right. If you choose to do it wrong and you detonate something, you're done. Though, and not just you, the whole industry. Well, of course, done. I mean, you know, I'm a roboticist, but I'm not the only one. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, this is a small industry I'm in. I practically know everybody that's in the well, industry. Well, this world fascinates me. I'll be honest. Like I've been wanting to get involved in it for a while, but I am also not one to jump into it. I mean, I realize you know that it's an incredibly challenging domain. Mm. I mean, even. So I, I've talked to a few people and, and they've kind of explained to me that you need to have an explosion gap, which means a lot of metal. And mm -hmm. so the weight is, is in some cases prohibitive. 
Well, what you have, well, there's multiple areas of protection, what they're known as uh, explosive protection. Okay, yeah. protection methods. So in the highest of order, the most stringently uh, controlled ones, whether the division one or zone zero, you have your, I believe division one allows for intrinsic safety, which is one, flame proof or explosion proof, which is where you can contain the explosion either inside or outside from getting in. How do you define intrinsic safety? I've heard intrinsic safety is probably the most misused term out there. You will see all Maybe over the place. intelligence? <laughs> I think you need artificial intelligence just to figure the term out because <laughs> most people misuse the term in our in this area. Intrinsically safe, what people will say is, well, I want this robot to be intrinsically safe. Wonderful. Wow. Okay. Intrinsically safe means you need, you're only allowed to use no more than I believe it's like 400 millivolts of energy. Jesus, that's nothing. It's less than a watch battery. Yeah. Right. What it is that PTL doesn't operate on that. Nothing can. That's why you see these people, when you look very carefully at the instructions on an intrinsically safe cell phone, it states in the instructions, you cannot turn this cell phone on while you're in the area. <laughs> it's only intrinsically safe when it's off. <laughs> and battery, batteries are not allowed anywhere near it. So a lot of the intrinsically safe is really misunderstood. And when people say that, okay, I've built an intrinsically safe drone, I would ask anybody, I got $100 in my pocket to show me a intrinsically safe drone that actually has a true certificate that would be honored by anybody. I've seen them out there where they're, and when I've asked them, every one of them I've asked for on the internet has never provided me with the certificate. Yeah. Well, it's so, like these people that say they've got aerospace aluminum in their thing, they're like 6061, they're like- Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I can go to McMaster car and get all I want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but this intrinsic safety is kind of important being that it limits the amount of energy or the heat generated by the robot. And by eliminating that, it makes it very difficult. So, and batteries are absolutely off the chart because as you've seen in cell phones self-detonating, uh, a lot of I your lithium. I've seen it on way bigger stuff than that. I, the 787 Dreamliner had its issues. Actually, it actually burnt the airplane down. I mean, I've just, I mean, we just detonated some custom battery packs at the office the other day. So yeah. That's what I was thinking of. But so this is why. I'm not proud of it. But. This is why batteries are extremely re regulated in the uh, robotics for use in hazardous areas. They actually failed pretty gracefully. So they were. Um, were they, they were those Samsung cells, mm. the, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So they, they did not explode, they didn't burn, but there were some holes and some nasty off gas mm -hmm. So it wasn't horrible. So you can, now you could imagine that it could be used. However, you would have to produce a flame proof enclosure to protect the fueling surfaces in the uh, explosive environment for black, no ignition source. So the battery would have to be able to be contained in a method that would contain that energy. How much does that weigh? This is where it comes in. <laughs> Some of these are, the, the, I mean, we have a, in the one unit that we had developed, we had flame-proof enclosures on the uh, electronics, and they were coming in at about 40 or 50 kilograms Holy for crap. the enclosure. So you can imagine if you saw the... the, the it's like the, 100 pounds. So you saw the crane lifting the robot and how heavy the robot was. And then there's another protection method for class one different, which is purged and pressurized, which means you remove all the oxygen within the enclosures. So you can shrink the enclosure down, and, but remove any possibility of oxygen, but eliminates the battery because when a so battery- you purge with nitrogen? Nitrogen, mm -hmm. dry yeah. nitrogen. And you- Probably not helium, but like any noble gas. Any noble gas is- But nitrogen inert. is the least, least expensive and Correct. least likely to get into your electronics. Have, have you tried to purchase helium lately? Mess them up. <laughs> I've heard it's expensive. It's extremely expensive. Yes. But, uh... They yes. also fuck up an IMU, apparently. They can. But not with the IMUs I use. Well, the MEM stuff. Mm -hmm. What do you use? We have... I have a very nice source for mine. Was a uh, developer for the U.S. Navy. Cool. 
And uh, I mean, they use crazy stuff in the U.S. Navy. Well, of course, all these people are always looking for alternative areas to they take their their energies that they used to use for the navy six hundred thousand dollar imu that's actually they're not it's surprising <laughs> when you go through and cut through all the cheese and get to the bottom of it and say okay here we are but no we for example we developed a uh, a sonar that can image and it was designed with all of the acoustics the energy the piezos and the uh direction finding within itself using three IMUs that talk to each other. They all agree on a point which is north, and that's north. And then it uses the acoustics designed strictly for oil and gas. It's not designed for water. The The engineer came from the Navy, went ahead, redeveloped this whole positioning we system, and we shrunk it down really, really small. That's cool. We're still shrinking it. Nice. <laughs> so the idea is to get these components done this way. Uh, shrinking everything down, componentizing everything, and then putting them uh, it, it, into use that way. But they were able to get uh, sensitivity down for approximately over a 100 meter area. They're uh, they one centimeter over 100 meters. They're off. Wow. So very, very interesting how this gentleman did this. So, can you elaborate? Not that much on it yet. All right, fair enough. I still haven't put the patent in on it. Touche. <laughs> no, we, we. I'm interested, but I can I can understand that. It, it's uh, it, it's very interesting, and it's all based on the the software integrating the computer's vision through the acoustics, so it creates a, a, a acoustical image. But at the same time, it's also using the IMUs and a pencil beam sonars to distinctly tell where it is within a circle. Okay. So you imagine everything I deal with is inside of a circle, but it also is restrictive to magnetic north. So we have to use extremely delicate IMUs to find north within a sealed vessel. And uh, we were able to do that very nicely. That's so, awesome. And be able to look. And on top of that, the entire design process was geared around the restrictions installed by ATEX in class one, div one. So your energy output, your ability to purge and pressurize, your ability to flame proof the enclosure, even to the point where your, your piezo had to penetrate protective enclosures to protect the unit from explosion, but also be able to allow the energy to pass through it. So this is really good stuff. So, and it will enable anybody that wants to get into the this market to to help them out, especially with the robots I'm coming up with now. When does this hit the market? We're I'm well as soon as I get some more money. Number Fair, one, I know that. Game. <laughs> well, what I'm looking at right now is trying to merge with some people. We I have some contact from the UK. Some my uh, uh, partnership with the Brazilian company. So we're looking at trying to get all this uh, uh, put together. We have the robot itself done. That that's been done. And we tested the first prototype in Brazil, like I said, several weeks ago. And what amazes me, though, is I have to go to Brazil to get these uh, these initiatives done. And uh, but it it's getting there I mean, slowly. But you know, the COVID screwed it's everything. Awesome. Up. I mean, absolutely. It's almost like the year that wasn't. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah. So, and we are, you know, getting somewhere with that. So, yeah. Well, it was kind of nice, though. I feel like if you were on your toes, you could kind of get a leg up, you know, on the competition during that time. Well, at the same time, I'm also helping some of my competition, which also doesn't help me much. But then again, it goes back to that safety issue. So I'm helping any of my competition with making safe robots because I don't want to see them get damaged. I don't want to see the industry get uh, damaged by this in any way yeah so i will afford that knowledge to people and 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 tell them for example i had a group contact me and they put everything on their board they had all their engineers in one place and it was amazing to see them all they all had great points where they were going and then you just see them going they're saying we need this we need this we need this 
And one of them asked for a, uh, uh, can, can, I, can you find me a CPU that, that is uh, intrinsically safe? And I said, okay, the first thing you need to do is invest some money in understanding what this is, what you are getting into. Because if you knew this, you wouldn't ask that question. You would say, okay, how do I protect my CPU instead of how do I buy one? I've had that client too. So, and then you have to sort of, everybody's all excited by the beginning of the, of, of the presentation, but the end of the meeting. But by the end of the meeting, everybody's all of a sudden looking and go, what did we just open up? Where are we going? What, what do you mean? And then, of course, it comes to the battery because everyone wants this AI leaving it alone. I want to drop it in. It's going to inspect the inside of the tank, and I want to leave it alone. By itself. By like itself, it using AI. Yeah. There's only one problem with that. It's horseshit. Number one, the battery. Okay? Number two. Oh, lot. there's a lot of problems with that. There's a bigger one. There's a, the biggest one that I know of is the fact that a lot of these people come from the offshore. Water is a conductive. Water conducts away stray electricity. This is what causes most of the detonations. So you can imagine when the robot's coming back, like a helicopter flying on a, on a dry, humid, or dry day yeah. over the desert, it generates, by being elevated, not contacting the earth, it generates electricity. When it goes to land, there is a discharge before the helicopter lands. Trust me, in the Marines, when I watched the CH-53 fly over and the shore party would reach up and, and make the hooking connecting for lifting a pallet, and the 53 would hover at night, when we would do this at night, you could see the effect, the St. Elmo's fire on the end of the rotor blades, and you're just looking at this. Now, take a step back now. You're in a naphtha tank. A naphtha tank is not conductive, it's an insulant. So your robot basically, Positive. by moving around inside this area, is generating static electricity within it. It has no ground or no contact. The minute it gets to the area for recovery, it becomes contacted with a zone. And you go to take your hook to hook it up and lift it out. There's that's all it takes. Yeah. Just that differential amount of uh, what's known as a residual energy that is there will resolve itself through a static discharge. And poof, it's there we go. And then when I, yeah. and this is free to anybody. You can anybody can go out there and get into the uh, in, in, into the regulations that are involved in ATX Class One Div One in, in Metro and all these other places that do these certifications. You have to do your homework. So what I recommend to a lot of people is bring in your thinking person back when your design is still on a napkin, okay, and start understanding. I'm going into a different area. And then a lot of the stuff that you were used to in your offshore area had nothing to do with where you are now in this new strange area where a lot of big money is throwing a lot of money at you to help you uh, quantify this and then come up with an, uh, come up with an answer. Well, that's always been a kind of a qualm of mine with startups these days is I feel like it's less about revenue and more about um, how much can I raise? We have to. Yeah. We have to do, we have to ask how much can we raise, which is why I'm so bloody poor. It's because I keep telling people you can't do it. Yeah. Or the amount you will need will keep me poor because it's a, it, it's an unbelievable amount of money. And yeah. what we spent on no, our agreed. Robot, when I When I state what it would take to develop a robotic system that people are interested in, they're like, it's got to be less than that. Come on. Well... Okay, here's the example. To do one robot, to get it classified to walk through all three zones, zone two, zone one, zone zero. The cost, it took four years, 1.2 million euros. That's just the certification. It's like $1.6 million? That, that doesn't include the robot being destroyed in testing. Jeez. It doesn't include the changes. They just broke it. You have to detonate it. You basically take the robot and you take your flame-proof enclosure, fill it full of gas with all of your electronics in, fully functioning. God damn it, you can't even you, pull that stuff out. Nope, nothing comes out. It has to be as is. The only thing they do is drill a hole and tap it for the spark plug. They fill it full of butane or propane, depending on the level of certain cool. And they detonate it. And what they're looking for is any flame exposure through the flame-proof enclosure. And then they'll take it and they'll take a one kilogram target, or I'm sorry, projectile at one meter, 
and they will turn your robot and aim this at any part they want and impact it to get an energy release. Wait, a projectile one meter? One kilogram. Set one meter that's, distance. That's decent weight, okay. So it's dropping from one meter away and it will Got impact it. the robot. So just gravity. They take and rotate the robot around and they yeah. pick places. It's like a reverse drop test. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they aim it, boom, hit it. Trying to get uh, trying to get an energy release. So this method and 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 people that need to go ahead and get their robot certified, it's a it's a trip. What kind of assholes are on this board as well, I don't know. What's that? So what kind of assholes are on this board that test this stuff? Uh, anyone you can think of. I'm yeah. serious. I, I mean, every Friday we had a meeting. All the engineers would have a meeting. And then the, we, it's, a, it's considered a notifying body. Notifying body are the people that will go ahead and stamp it, like your underwriters, laboratories, like uh, in, uh, Intertech, DECRA, and other people that are out there that do this certification process. And every Friday, you would present to them what you had. And the answer they returned to you was, yes, we have no bananas. Basically, is what it came down to. Yes, we have no bananas. You would look at each other going, oh, what did he just say? I th and <laughs> we're, we're going through the... Okay, and then we would ask them, well, what can we do? Well, lo and behold, they're not allowed to tell you what to do. All they can do is look at what you did and say yes or no. If it's no, you have to pay him for next week to come again Jesus. next week. And then next week. Sounds like job week. security. It's huge job security. So this is why I tell these people, put the people that know how to get there in the beginning of your innovation. Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? And, and I, this is why, again, I've explained to myself, I'm basically poor because I've told people, nope. You will do this, 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 and this, and it won't go. No, what do you going. mean? And then I'm sitting there again. I get paid for five minutes of, of a consultation and nothing else. <laughs> because they, they've said, no, it's too much money. We can't afford that kind of stuff. So, But uh, it, 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 is, it is a tremendous way to go. But I do believe it is the future. I mean, this is how we're going with everything. This is, this is where everything wants to go. I mean, it's only a matter of time, but we need to get there safely in this field. I mean, we can take a lot of stuff and migrate it into this field, but this field is very dangerous. And, and what I see it is a lot of people to use this as opportunity. Like I said, the nefarious types out there that will stamp anything. Just charlatans. And charlatans. And yes, I've, I've seen a few come across the table or even the language and the work of the description of what it is contradicts the uh, safety methods. So. If you stuck around this long and you liked what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. We're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and please come to the next one.